We can never get enough of nature. We need the tonic of wildness to wade in marshes where the bittern and the meadow hen lurk and hear the booming of the snipe, to smell the whispering sedge where only some wilder and more solitary fowl builds her nest and the mink crawls with its belly close to the ground. So wrote Henry David Thoreau, writer, pencil maker, and self-appointed inspector of snowstorms. He wrote these lines in a cabin he built himself for $28, 12 and a half cents, here near Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts in 1845. Silver Springs is a thermostatic, chemostatic, and biostatic ecological community in seasonally pulsing steady state climax. The rate of primary production of the whole community is linearly proportional to the light intensity under natural conditions. The efficiency of primary production relative to incoming light of usable wavelengths reaching plant level is about 5.3 percent. So wrote Howard T. Odom, professor, author, and pioneer ecologist, describing a freshwater spring and pond here in Silver Springs, Florida in 1957. His words were part of a scientific article in a technical journal. For Thoreau, the most important thing was to go to the woods to front only the most essential facts of life. To live life as deliberately as nature and not be thrown off the track by every nutshell and mosquito's wing that falls on the rails. To stand right fronting face to face to a fact and see the sun glimmer on both its surfaces as if it were a scimitar and feel its sweet edge dividing you through the heart and marrow. In other words, to live in nature and with nature and not set oneself above nature. We should, Thoreau advised, learn nature's secrets not in order to conquer her or to exploit her resources. Instead, we should learn to live in harmony with nature and indeed to unite with nature in a kind of emotional and spiritual union. For Odom, the important thing was to understand the workings of nature so that we could predict what would happen if things changed. For instance, what would happen if we changed the energy input, if we modified the food chains, if we changed the abiotic base, or if some toxic waste entered the web? How could we improve the productivity of pond, farm, or forest? In other words, the goal was a scientific understanding of nature so that we humans could better control nature for our own human purposes. Both of these approaches to the natural world have long histories. Only recently have they come together to help form the modern science of ecology and to spark the environmental movements of the past decades. The tradition that Thoreau represents is sometimes called the naturalist tradition, its roots go back to Greek and Roman civilization. Thoreau himself was fond of quoting Homer, Cicero, Virgil, Pliny, and other classical writers as authorities for what he called a noble, clear-sighted way of life. This was and is an approach to nature that lays great stress on direct experience, on minimal interference in the great cycles of nature, on wilderness and the purity of unsullied natural things. It is a tradition that has much in common with some Eastern religions, like Buddhism, Hinduism, and Taoism. Though individuals often mixed them together, the historical tradition that Odom grew from was different from that of Thoreau.
In earlier times, it was most openly stated by the philosopher Francis Bacon in 16th century England. Bacon was not much interested in a humble reverence for nature. He wanted to dominate her, to understand and then to use nature for human purposes. The enlargement of the bounds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible, wrote Bacon. The world is made for man, not man for the world. Some scholars point out that Bacon, one of the early pioneers in scientific philosophy, took his basic approach to nature directly out of the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim religious traditions of the Western world. God created the heavens and the earth, says the Bible, and he placed Adam and Eve on earth to take charge, to have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. At about the same time that Henry David Thoreau was building his cabin here at Walden Pond, another naturalist across an ocean was strolling down a path behind his country home in Down, England. He was putting together ideas that would shock the scientific and social world of his day and of ours. His name was Charles Darwin. Darwin, like Thoreau, was fascinated by nature. He began, as many naturalists have always begun, by observing nature and by making collections of beetles, butterflies, and other plants and animals near his home. But Darwin went a step further. He wondered. He asked himself questions, big questions, like why are there so many different kinds of plants and animals? How did each plant and animal get to be the way it is today? How is one plant or animal related to the other plants and animals living around it? And to the physical environment, the rocks, the water, the soil, the climate. When Darwin got a chance to go on a voyage of exploration around the world as an unpaid naturalist, he snapped up the opportunity. At every stop on the five-year-long voyage of His Majesty's ship Beagle, Darwin would go ashore and explore the local geology and the living communities of plants and animals he found there. Back home in England, he settled in a quiet country home outside London to study, and eventually to write a world-famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. In this book, Darwin pulled together his observations with those of other naturalists and geologists. More important, he explained them with a new theory of evolution. This new theory laid basic foundations for all of biology, as well as for the yet-to-be-born science of ecology. Nature, wrote Darwin, is a web of complex relations in which each organism plays a role. Ecologists today call this an ecosystem with niches. All organic beings, wrote Darwin, are striving to seize on each place in the economy of nature. In other words, there is a struggle for existence in all these ecosystems. All living things produce more offspring than can survive. There is always a variation in traits in offspring, so which will survive? The fittest, wrote Darwin. The merest trifle would often give the victory to one organic being over another. Thus, nature selects who will survive. Through this process of natural selection, given enough time, whole new species will be created. Darwin's ideas were controversial in his own day, as they are in ours. The vast majority of modern biologists, however, accept and use the framework that Darwin provided to help make sense of their own investigations into natural living systems today. Of all the specialized sciences gathered together under the term biology, the science of ecology, more than any other, builds on the insights Darwin provided. It was only in our own 20th century, however, that ecology came to be a science in its own right and only in the last 25 years that it has burst upon the public scene with such dramatic impact. 
Some think this greatly increased public awareness came directly out of the first photographs taken of our planet Earth from outer space. Here at last, the ideas of Darwin and others in the 19th century, that nature is a complex web of relationships colonizing a remarkably live planet was obvious to everyone on Earth. Get down to the details, however, and you run into hornet nests of controversy. Professional ecologists like Howard Odom began to learn some of the secrets of these living webs of life when they did field studies of ecosystems in the 1950s. You know, one of the most influential of these studies was the one Odom did of this freshwater pond here in Silver Springs, Florida. Unlike Thoreau, Odom and his students did more than observe with the unaided senses. They brought in, you see, all the sophisticated technology of modern science that they could find or invent. They were especially interested in quantitative studies, that is, measuring things in numbers. It wasn't enough to see the sunlight glimmer on the silvery surface. They wanted to know exactly how many kilocalories of energy came into this pond every minute, every hour. They wanted to know how much of that energy was taken up by the producers, the green plants, and how much was taken by the consumers, plants and animals. They wanted to know in quantitative detail what the relationships were between each snail, fish, bird, and water plant. And from their measurements, they constructed detailed flow charts, not unlike factory organization charts, to trace what happened to the energy and matter in the living ecosystem. And they published their findings in scientific journals, complete with charts, graphs, and footnotes. At the same time, naturalists, poets, backpackers, and wilderness lovers used some of the new scientific knowledge about natural systems to enjoy and promote nature in much the same holistic spiritual way that Thoreau had done in the last century. In later years, some of these nature lovers went further. Natural foods, natural cures, natural balances, herbal and new age cures became popular. Some nature lovers went still further and began to look on science and technology, as well as capitalism and progress, as suspect activities and ideas. The very possibility of human progress led by science and reason was sharply challenged. It was very different in the 19th century. Although there were a few dissenters like Thoreau, William Burroughs, John Jacob Audubon, the general attitude of scientists as well as ordinary citizens in 19th century America was anti-wilderness. President Thomas Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark to explore the vast American wilderness in 1804 to 1806. They were directed to observe and record what they found it was also clear that they were to be the vanguard of a nation intent on conquering the wilderness. This was the beginning of what would later be called our manifest destiny to create a great civilized nation from ocean to ocean. New knowledge of nature's web of relationships served to encourage practical farmers, lumbermen, wildlife managers, and engineers of all kinds to more effective ways to manage that web they wanted nature to produce more food, more lumber, more hunting and fishing opportunities, and more energy and natural resources for a growing nation. In order to assure the continued bounty of nature in this sense, conservation movements began. President Theodore Roosevelt, a big game hunter himself, led the way. National parks and national forests were established. Laws governing hunting and fishing were passed and enforced. One of the most interesting and significant of the scientists who bridged the gap between the Thoreau-inspired whole nature approach and the Darwin-inspired scientific approach was a wildlife expert named Aldo Leopold. Leopold began his career in the Theodore Roosevelt conservation tradition. In 1924, he became assistant director of the U.S. Forest Products Laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin. By that time, he was already beginning to question, though, and to move away from some parts of the conservation ethic. 
He soon came to denounce, for instance, the ruthless extermination of predators in America. He also began to question the whole idea of human progress as a technological juggernaut that was harming nature and man. Here in this cabin in the sand country along the Wisconsin River, Leopold wrote his classic book, Sand County Almanac. In it, he gave his maturing views about nature, society, and man. Conservation is getting nowhere, wrote Leopold, because it is incompatible with our Abrahamic concept of land. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. That land is a community is the basic concept of ecology, but that land is to be loved and respected is an extension of ethics. In 1962, the biologist Rachel Carson carried these ideas a step further in a famous book, Silent Spring. In this book, she warned that unless we changed our ways and cut back drastically on modern toxic chemical pollution, we would end up destroying the very biosphere we all depend upon for our life. Carson's book was read by millions of people and probably more than any other single thing had great influence on the environmental movements today. In the last decades of the 20th century and now in the first decade of the 21st century, some of these activists have pioneered in combining ecological science with humanistic values to help preserve natural ecosystems around the world. Tropical rainforests, Arctic wildlife preserves, wetlands, old growth forests, lakes great and small, and the vast ocean ecosystems they warn are threatened with radical change from human activities most especially today by the very real possibility of global warming. Let's look in part two of this program at some of the fundamental concepts of ecology today and of the controversies.